Hey, good morning, Adventure. We are going to get started. It's good to see you. Good to have you with us. It's nice that fall is finally falling and coming in. Uh, hey, if this is your first time with us, on the card are some tables that have uh, the Adventure sticker at the top, and they have the words Welcome Home on there. If you'll complete that and turn that in, uh, down at the uh, Welcome Center down there, we have some gifts we want to send home with you. A um, couple things for you as we get going. Um, the disaster response team, we're probably going to make a supply run down there in a couple or three weeks. We'll, we'll publish a list here pretty quick. We found an area that's being overlooked, and that's the area we're going to focus in. It's actually south of Asheville, North Carolina, across the border into South Carolina. And uh, so we're going to see about working with them, uh, but we'll get some stuff out to you. And just this first trip will just be to run supplies, light stuff down. Um, if you're interested, if you're medical personnel and you're interested in the Amazon trip, the sign-up sheet is back there. You have to be signed up by the first weekend in November because then we're going to start having meetings and getting set, all that. Trunk or treat is a week from tonight. We still need cars, so if you can fill out. We don't have very many signed up. You can fill out, decorate your trunk, and hand out candy. That would be amazing. All right, we appreciate you for doing that. So today we're uh, into a new series and we're looking at living a life of freedom, le learning how to escape some, kind of some of the bonds of the world here and living in a positive, enlightened way with Jesus. And so as we do that today, we're going to start this new series and we're going to look at some of the things that hold us back from that and how to, how to actually, what's the antidote to those things that hold us back. So that's where we're going to go today. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for loving us, and thank you for the opportunity to come and be here today. And Father, we just ask you teach us from your spirit, you teach us through your word. Father, we ask that you receive our praise today as we lift our voices together, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, I'm going to invite you to stand, and let's get rolling. Worthy is the Lamb who 
but slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free, oh Jesus I sing done for me that's only the beginning here we got a
coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me.
See if my voice holds out for this whole thing. <clears throat> Harvest is killing me, Mark. <laughs> Farmers out spraying dust into the wind. Um, it is good to be with you guys. We're uh, we're gonna start into a new series here today, and um, we're gonna do it multiple ways. It's about seven weeks that we're gonna go through this, and so we're gonna do a few of them together, and then we're gonna each do some uh, separately here, but. Um, I, I want to be real clear about kind of what the heart of this series is and even the heart of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so scripture says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, okay? And, and it's important to understand who God is, uh, to understand he is creator and who we are in relationship to him. And that is, that is really, really important. And one of the things that I found is especially early on in our our Christ following, our, uh, our relationship with God, a lot of us start off in a place of um, looking at what's in scripture and realizing, hey, I don't, I don't line up with this. There's a lot of things in my life that are wrong. They're not exactly what God wants. And so we find, we find these lists in scripture of things that we know God says, these aren't like me. These are not things that are right. These aren't things that are holy or righteous, and so, you know, these things shouldn't be in your life. They should be a red flag. They should be a red flag. Um, and sometimes, we never grow past that for lots of different reasons. And um, I, I think a lot of people, uh, they relate more to God based on fear of screwing up. It's kind of like having the stern dad who's always watching, just waiting to be on your case because you, know, you messed up just in that, that smallest of degree. I think a lot of people, for lots of different reasons, I right. mean, some of that may be just that's the way your family's always viewed God, maybe um, just your, your kind of church background, religion, faith, they kind of emphasize that. Um, some, it may just be part of our personality and, and some of the things that we've gone through. I, I did a, a Facebook poll on my, uh, on my <laughs> Facebook page and just asked the question, like growing up, did you, did you experience or were you taught more the love of God or the fear of God? And it was interesting. Um, one of the things I found interesting was that there are a couple of people that answered that I grew up with. Like we went to the same church um, like in children's ministry and high school, uh, going all the way through, our families knew each other. And, and for me, I would answer that question and say, man, God's love was really emphasized. And they, they took it, whatever they went through, even though we were in the same church, going through the same stuff. I mean, albeit again, same, different families. Right. But um, it was more the fear of God that they felt like was emphasized. And again, you can have three brothers, and they all end up in different places and have gone through some of the same things, right? So 
Some of it may just be how we, how we interact with God, our personality, and lots of different things. But the whole premise of this series is this. Um, if you think that God is just sitting waiting on you to screw up, and you live your life with the majority of your energy and your time in relationship with God just worried about being a screw up, that's not good. Right. It's not healthy. It's not good, and that, that's not what God intended. Now, um, if, if you go back to Matthew 5, Jesus is, is going through the Sermon on the Mount, and he does several things where he says, okay, you guys have heard it said this, but like, I want to redirect you. I, I think scripture does that throughout the New Testament because we do start off with things. I mean, we definitely have lists of things that are not godly, um, but God doesn't want us to stay just in this fear factor right. um, where we're worried about screwing up with the list. He wants to, to move us on to something. And um, just, again, just for the, the sake of the series, even just the theme of what we're getting at today, uh, I, I, maybe this is an impract or imperfect, it's definitely an imperfect analogy, but I, I was thinking about my brother, Todd. He's a pilot. He's an airline pilot, which actually, you could be praying for my brother and his family, um, my sister-in-law's mom has just a couple of days to live. They found out she had cancer like two weeks ago, and they are, they're waiting for her to go. So they're going through a hard time right now. So be praying for my brother Todd and his family. Um, but Todd's a pilot, and uh, I, I know you've spent a lot of time in your youth flying. Well, you didn't fly planes. You, like, stole seats on planes. I, I, I hitchhiked. Hitchhiked on planes. Um, so pilots, what do they do when they get in? Like, you've seen Top Gun, right? Well, actually, Top Gun didn't show any of this nope. part. It's the checklist, right? They go yep. through all the checklists of things. Checklists are good, but I don't think you want your pilot the entire flight, like, staring at a checklist. You want them looking out at where they're going, right? right. And so God, in a sense, has given us checklists to, to look at in our life. But those are the starting point to get us to a point where we can really fly and we can, we can actually experience the life that he designed us to. And so we're going to focus in on that a little bit over the next seven weeks. So we're going to look at some, uh, some, some things that are on those checklists, but we don't want to get so stuck in those checklists that we never grow beyond them. And we're going to talk about the checklists and some things that are there that definitely shouldn't be in our life, but then what God, I think, wants us to spend most of our time sorting through and living out. Is that fair? Yeah, is that, that's fair. that kind of pull it together? Yep, that's fair. Um, because it really does matter. You know, maybe some people would argue it doesn't matter which way you see God, but I think how it, you view God matters. It matters a lot. Um, I think sometimes the English language doesn't help us mm. uh, in Scripture because, like, we talk about there's 365 commands, fear not. Yeah. We use that this year. But then it says... Fear God. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the yeah, fear absolutely. of God, the fear of the Lord is this. And, but it, what we don't understand, because English is, English is a really crude language. There's four different words for fear mm. in the Hebrew. Yeah. Uh, except that one of them has nothing to do with being afraid. It has to do with, with reverence and awe right. and amazement. And that's what it's talking about when it says to fear God which it would just be better if the English translators had just come, well, Old English, it was, that's the problem. Right. But it, if they just come out and said, you know, reverence God, be in awe of God, that would be a whole different ball game. But uh, it wasn't a good translation. Yeah, and, and again, I think some of it has just been what sometimes as churches we've emphasized. Um, I, I find there are a lot of people who live kind of in this uh, thou shalt not relationship with God where you go back to the Ten Commandments and a lot of you the first time you probably heard them or maybe if you've seen them like written somewhere it's in King eight, James. Eight out of ten or not. <laughs> yeah and it's <laughs> thou shalt not right and so there are dangers of a thou shalt not relationship with God and like this is important to recognize. Now again there's passages where God lists things that we shouldn't be doing. Um, we've got several specifically that we're just going to kind of walk through as we go through this series here. You got Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 is probably the easiest one to kind of sort through quickly. Um, he says there's six things which the Lord hates, and then he kind of changes his mind. He's like, oh, wait, actually, there's seven. And no, I think he. There's no delete or whiteout. Yeah, there was then. no delete or whiteout back then. So you just kept writing. Um, and, and so they go through and, and they give us some very specific things haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. And 
those are fairly clear. Um, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, which we're going to work off of a little bit too, um, gives us a whole bunch of the things that actually feed into those seven, right? And so there's a whole list there. We're not going to read through all of that, but it just kind of leads into, uh, into those seven and, and reinforces some of that. And so there's definitely things that God says don't do. Um, but if, if you live a, a relationship focused on the thou shalt nots, like if you live your life just with those, if you took those two passages and pasted them up in every place in your car, you know, on your, right. on your, uh, on your mirror when you get good. up in the morning, if you focus on that, what you're going to find is that a relationship that's just focused on the stuff you're not supposed to do, what it tends to do is cultivate a relationship with God that's based on fear and intimidation. Right. I have met a lot of those people through the years. It's like dieting. Thou Is shalt it? not, yeah, thou shalt not eat I this. Try not what to am do I going to eat? I'm going to eat that. Because that's where your brain focuses on. Right. And if you've got that up there all the time, you're always going to have that right. put out in front of you. Yeah. So the alternative to, to kind of living a thou shalt not life, and again, we're not saying that those things that are in uh, Proverbs 6 and in Galatians 5 and, and other places where God says, look, this stuff isn't who I am and it's not who I've called you to be. It's not to say that those aren't important things, but God's goal for us is not just to live day in and day out fearful of breaking a rule and making God mad. God's goal for us, the alternative to this, is a life that's devoted to imitating Christ. That's, that's what being a believer is all about. Um, Again, that, that means that we change things in our life, but it doesn't mean that we go through. We're supposed to be looking for being like Jesus, not, not like who I used to be and who everybody else is, right? Yeah, right. That's one of those uh, things we don't do well with. I remember my driver's ed teacher, Mr. Sheese, would always yell at us, get your eyes back on the road. <laughs> and we're like, I'm looking at the road. And he would say, no, if you were looking at the road, we would be on the road. Um, <laughs> But you, you, the car's going to drift toward what you look at. And if you're focused on the negative, if you're focused on the shame or the terror all the time, that's what you're going to drive into all the time. I, I don't know about you guys. I, I know what it feels like to go through life just with guilt and just dealing with those things. Because I've, I've been in this type of relationship before. I, I, I understand this very, very well. And what happens when you're, when you're just trying to tiptoe through life, not ticking off your dad is you, you end up spending life looking down and in. Right. Right, you're constantly looking in and you're beating yourself right. up for every little thing that you did and you're looking down at your feet and you're like, man, I can't screw up, I can't screw up, I can't screw up. Which, by the way, when you tell yourself you can't screw up like 30 times, what are you guaranteed to do? Screw, screw up. up, absolutely. It's gonna happen. Um, you know, it's if you happen. look at Adventure's logo, yep. we've, got, we've got a compass and it's not pointed down and in, it's actually pointed up and forward. Like, that's the goal, is up and forward. You know, Ephesians 5, 1 through 2, going back to Ephesians for a minute, it says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you're his dear children, live a life filled with love following what? The example of Christ, right? So God doesn't tell us, all right, every moment of every day, I want you to focus on all the things you're not supposed to do, and I want you to beat yourself up every time that you, you start to toe the line. No, he says, I want the, the primary focus of your life to be where? In Christ, and and being like Him, I, I think this is just a this is just a really important growing. kind of core component of this whole series. God's goal for us is not to, it's to be like Christ. It's not so much about not being who we were as much as it is being like Christ. If we are being like Christ, you know what's guaranteed? We won't be who we were. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that kind of clear? Um, and I like Galatians five twenty four through twenty five because I think it. It reemphasizes that. It says, those who belong to Christ Jesus, they nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross, and they crucified him there. We crucified who we were. That's gone. We, you know, that's part of what baptism is. We leave it in the grave. It's gone at that point, and we come back up, and it says, since we're living by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So, yeah, again, this is an imperfect example. You know, my brother Todd, when he looks at that checklist, that checklist is just a small percentage of his actual flying time. You know, I don't know if it's 80, 20. I mean, I don't know how to put right. a percentage on this, but I, I really believe wholeheartedly that 
the, the checklist part of, okay, here's, here's what I don't want to be. We need to check ourselves, but man, that's supposed to be the small percentage of our life. The big percentage is supposed to be looking at Christ. Let me, let me, give, a, let me give you a thought in this. So I've, I've never hit, I struggle with depression. I'm always like three to four seconds from tears. I mean, I can be busted just, I'm like a water balloon if I'm not careful. And uh, in my struggle with depression, I can focus on feelings of failure. I can focus on negativity. I can focus on sadness. I don't know why I feel those things, but they're real. Mm. I mean, they're tangible. And I feel them all the time. But what I've learned to do is rather than focus on those things that I feel and that really want to dominate what I, what I do is I switch my thinking over, and whenever I, I, I feel that being overwhelmed, I remember how much joy the Lord gives me, and that the best joy I can have is in serving Him. And so I kind of, it's kind of like with a puppy or a kitten, you distract and you relocate, right? You do the refocus thing. And so I've had to learn how to do that with myself. And what I've learned by doing that is, it's better for me to imitate Christ than to try to be the best version of me. Oh, that's good. Because the best version of me is going to suck no matter what. I'm a human being, right? Agreed. I'm going to mess up. So when I focus on Christ and I focus on the joy that I have knowing that Christ someday is going to take all this stuff away from me and I'm not going to feel it anymore, I find myself not feeling it so much. Yeah. I find that when I look at what God's purpose for me is, what God's goal for me is, and I make that the objective of my life instead of feeling good, I feel better. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense? Yeah, so, so if there's a principle in here that we're really trying to get to, it's just this idea that if, if we focus on God's positive goals, that internal battle that, that we struggle with, that those of us who, again, we, we struggle a lot with that guilt, and it's just kind of we constantly feel like we're trying to please an unpleasable dad, that stuff starts going away. Your internal battle with what he hates is going to fade away. Why? Because we're focused in on the things that he's called us to. And, and if you want the things that God has called us to focus to, those lists are there too. And it's interesting because those lists are in some ways simpler then right. the, all the, because it'd be an, in it, there's an inexhaustive list of ways that we've come up with that are, are, you know, in rebellion against God. But God says, this is actually what I want you to focus in on. This is who Jesus is. This is what the Holy Spirit is leading us to. Look at Galatians 5, 22 through 23. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And he says, so those are the things to spend 80% of your day on. You know, if you're looking for those things and how to cultivate those things in your life, frankly, the other battles, I, I'm not saying that it's just going to poof, go away. I'm not saying there won't be moments of pride. I'm not saying there won't be moments where you screw up, but they will become less and less. Okay, so with recovery, hmm. the first step, step one, Basically, I've got to admit you got a problem. I'm out of control. Yep. I don't have control. Yep. All right. So when we're looking at this stuff and growing to be like Christ, what's the very first thing we have to deal hmm. with? Well, yeah, that's, that's good. I, and it goes to the very first thing that's on that list in Proverbs. So if you go back to that list in Proverbs, we're, we're looking at the battle with pride. Pride's the, the very first thing that's listed there. Now, the word pride's not there. Um, it, it says it this way. Hottie eyes, which hottie's not H O T T I E like me. It's H A U G H T Y. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> me, that. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so it's 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 a it's a, what is hottie? It's, it's poetic Hebrew. Uh, hottie eyes are eyes that just look down on everybody. Yeah, literally that superiority complex yeah, we we've got those um we've got those euphemisms those little things we say like somebody yeah. who looks down, looks down their nose, nose at other people that's what this is talking about i i kind of like whenever you see us by the way if you ever see us use jps so like every time we put scripture in we put what translation we're getting it out of and if you see jps that's jewish publication service it's actually the modern hebrew Society. bible 
Yeah, society, sorry. Yeah, society. Um, they, they do it this way, a haughty bearing, which I like even better because right. it really it gets that idea that this is an attitude that we've got, right? Because it's not just about how we see people. It's, it's how we interact with people. It's how we, just how we view people from like right. their core. Right. Um, so pride is, is the very first thing. And it's got some characteristics. Yeah. Um, and those characteristics, some of those we can find in that passage in Galatians 5. So if you look in there, there's a few things. We're not going to go through all of these. Each week we'll kind of pick some of these out and we'll show you how they tie in with each other. But pride is fed by, first and foremost, selfish ambition. I think that one's probably fairly self-explanatory. Everybody got what selfish ambition is? It's pretty much just I put me it's first and my wants. It's that internal stuff. Yeah, it's my internal stuff. It, this is what I want. This is, you know... Basically, I'm the center of the universe. That's kind of what selfish ambition is, right? right. Uh, the second one in that list that we find is envy. Do you want to talk about envy? Kind of lay out what envy is? Yeah, envy is actually a sense of resentment towards someone who has something you want. Hmm. Um, and so it's, it's, a little, it's a little more aggressive. Yeah. Um, it might take action, actually. Um, but it's, kind of, it's, it, it's a, kind of a kissing cousin to jealousy. Yeah, and, and jealousy is one we want to kind of take a, just a minute on because I, I've found through the years as we talk about jealousy, jealousy is a little confusing because Scripture actually says that God is jealous. And so, like, how can God be jealous and that be okay? And, again, bad English. Yeah, it is. Because it's two different words in the Hebrew between jealousy is a sin and God being jealous. Two yeah. different words. And, and it's really two different concepts, too. Two different concepts. So let's talk, about, let's talk about righteous jealousy and unrighteous jealousy. So righteous jealousy is a passion to defend the honor and the integrity and the purity of what's been entrusted to it's me. It's protective. It is protective. Um, probably the easiest way, Dave, you mind putting that up on the screen? Uh, probably the easiest, easiest way for me to paint a picture around this is to think about this kind of in the same way where we see God using it in terms of relationships. So when we see in the Old Testament, God saying, I am a jealous God, the places where he says that are always in relationship with Israel. Right. And he always, he talks about Israel like having a marriage relation. It's a covenantal relationship that God has with his people. And it's very much like a marriage relationship. Um, that's kind of the language that we see used. And so he's saying, look, in this covenant, I am, I am jealous of. You can't have any other gods. In other words, you can't have any other husband. You know, in our marriages, it would be you can't have any other spouse. You can't have another husband, another wife, another boyfriend, another girlfriend other than me. Your, the, your heart is supposed to be with me, and I'm jealous for that. And so God does that. He, he guards that relationship with Israel. He sends them prophets. He gives them the law. I mean, he goes. He tries he, over and over. He tries over and over and over again to protect them and protect the relationship with each other. You know, when, when Christina and I got married, we gave each other permission to, uh, to be jealous of that relationship with each other. In other words, if, if she sees me looking at somebody else or I see her looking at somebody else, it's okay to go, that's not allowed. That's not right. Uh, and to defend that in some way, shape, or form and to, to like get into, into the, the, the grid of it and say, hey, this needs to stop and, and bring it to a light. Now, the other side, unrighteous... Which is a completely different word in the Hebrew. Yeah, unrighteous jealousy tries to control that which is not rightfully mine. Okay? So, those of you who've been through my boundaries class or been through boundaries with, um, with Jim, I know he's taught it before, this will make a lot of sense. There are some things, like in that relationship between my wife and I, so we made a covenantal relationship. Now, here's the deal. Can my wife break that covenant? She can. Can I stop her? No, I can't. I, I can't go beyond, and I, I can't like physically take her and tie her up and stick. I mean, I can do that, but it's illegal, and you go to jail for things like that. Why do we do that? Because that's a violation of her free will. Does that make sense? And so we see God doing that. God right. does that with Israel. He says over and over, look, don't, you know, don't, don't have any other God but me. Don't flirt with anybody else but me. Like our relationship is exclusive. And then Israel will do what? 
They start worshiping other gods. They start walking away from God and their relationship with them. And what does he do? He respects their free will and he lets them go. Uh, this, this goes back to Jesus and the uh, parable of the prodigal son. If you remember that, you've got the dad and you've got the son and the son says, look, dad, like I don't respect you. I just want my money. I want your inheritance. I wish you were dead. I'm just going to go live my life. And it breaks the dad's heart. They're in a covenantal. I mean, the relationship between a father and son, that's a covenantal thing. That's something God established. And yet God's the, the father in that story, God still allows the son to do what? To walk away because he's not going to go past that free will. He's not going to, to go beyond that. That would be unrighteous jealousy uh, because it goes on, it tries to control something that's not really there. Look at James 3, 15 through 16. It says, jealousy, for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic, and wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, and those two things go always together, there you'll find disorder and evil of every kind. So well, I like that James says it's demonic. Yeah. Because what he's doing is he's looking back in history to when Satan said, I could sit on God's throne. Mm. I should be sitting up there. Yeah. And so he's tying that. To, basically, it's the same sin. Yeah. It, well, and it comes back to that, that thing that we're talking about here, which is what? Pride. Right? Pride's what feeds all of this. Pride is the thing that's outside of, of the limits of who God has called us to be and what he's designed us to be. Okay, so question. So how do we bring our lives in line with that positive idea that God has made? If pride's an attitude, and if uh, selfish ambition, jealousy, and envy um, are kind of the inter internal makers or markers of that attitude, what's the antidote then for living outside the works of the flesh? Mm. I mean, what, kind of walk me through that. What's it take to, to resist that? So let, let me just say this real quick, because I, I just want to go back and make this point. Um, we still need that checklist. Yeah. Am I prideful? Yeah. yeah. Do I have moments of selfish ambition and jealousy and unrighteous? Yes, I, I struggle with all of those things. So again, I'm going to tell you, you still need the checklist. And every once in a while, you got to go back and go, Okay, what am I feeling here? And like, where's that coming from? We need those moments, but that's supposed to be the smaller percentage of our day, right? That's, that's just a check on ourself, not our focus. Where's our focus supposed to be? Well, the opposite of pride is what? It's an attitude of humility. Humility, yeah. Frankly, if, if you go through your day actively trying to live in a humble manner, pride's not going to show up too much, right? It's like the antidote to it. If you do this, then this just doesn't rear its head much anymore. So when I focus on being humble and imitating Christ, and again, that is our goal. That's the goal, right? Look at Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Though he was God, Jesus didn't think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave. He was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God. This is all about humility. This is about going through life. I think practically, and I don't know if we did this well Thursday night, practically, you know, humility is simply going through our life and going, okay, how can I serve? Right, that's the bottom line. How can I serve people? So when you're focused in your life on service, does pride pop up as much? It's not going to. You know, what humility does is it provides the, the soil for a lifestyle of gentleness. If we're going to go back through that list of things that God wants to create in our lives, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As we were talking through this, gentleness is that thing to kind of focus in on. Now, gentleness, gentleness might sound a little weird to you because, frankly, gentleness isn't something we talk about in our culture. No. Uh, it's a word that we don't even really, other than like, other than with toddlers, be gentle, quit smacking your brother in the face. Um, other right. than that, like, we don't use this word much anymore. So, Break down this word just a little bit. How sure. else can we think about this word, so gentleness? The, uh, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, blessed are the meek, mm. for they shall inherit the earth. Another word, and we have no and idea what it means. Meekness and gentleness go together. But we don't understand. For us, they look like weakness. But the actual, the actual concept 
uh, in the Greek for this concept of meekness and gentleness, I, the, the, the person I think of with this, I think of Kathy Krukenberg with this. So Kathy goes out and gets these. Is it because she controls Mark? Because she's, she's got, small and she controls Mark? She put the ring in his nose. Um, <laughs> no, Kathy goes out west and they take these wild, wild Mustangs that have not known ownership, have not known a human. Much like Mark. Much like Mark. And she Formally. brings them back, and over a period of time, she takes this Mustang and teaches it to yield. If this Mustang still has every ounce of strength it had when it was wild. Thousand pounds and she's but like, now what, it's 60? But now that Mustang is under control. So the real concept for the Greeks of meekness was power that was under control. Mm -hmm. And they literally used it to describe a horse that had gone from wild to being under controlled and being useful, mm -hmm. but still, still could be wild if it wanted to, but it learned not to be wild. It learned to be productive. It learned to produce. And that's really the concept behind all this. It's, it's strength and control. Strength under control. Yeah. yeah. It's strength under control. Um, guys, I would tell you that's part of what masculinity is supposed to be. Yeah. It's strength under control. Not weakness. This is not about weakness. Gentleness is not about weakness. Um, you know, it, I, I used, uh, which doesn't fit. I, remember Gentle Ben? That was the one oh, that like, yeah. popped into my mind. And then I had somebody who uh, is young enough, they have no idea who Gentle Ben is. And I was having to explain like, who Gentle Ben was for them. Um, and they were like, oh, like King Kong. And I was like, yeah, like King Kong when he's got the, the girl and he doesn't squish her, right? That's, that's the idea of gentleness and meekness is that, that that power and that ability is there, but it's under control. Um, look at Colossians 3, 12 through 13. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. If you need a, if you're struggling with what gentleness and meekness is, just go back to that. Just use that as kind of a working definition of, okay, what does this look like in my life? And when that gets applied into our life, like, it, it shifts us. It changes us. And, and honestly, it's a position that changes everything around us to be more in that godly state that God designed. Look at Proverbs 15.1. It says, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. You got a choice. You know, when you're ticked off and when you're ready to go and your boss said something or your coworker said something or your kid said something, your spouse said something or whoever, and you got that opportunity, like, which am I going to choose? Are you supposed to sit there and beat yourself up and go, okay, I'm not going to be prideful? Look, don't even worry about the prideful part in that moment. Just go, I'm going to forgive. I'm going to love. I'm going to be humble. Like, if you focus on that, the other isn't going to rear its head. Well, in all three of these scriptures we're looking at right here, these were all written at a time when might made right. Oh, very much. If you were strong, yeah. that, was, that was where to be, and that was a very violent time. It was a very unfair time, a uh, very cruel time. And he's saying, look, if you're going to be my people, you're going to be exactly the opposite of what you see happening in the world around you. People yeah. are going to be violent. You're not going to be violent. People are not going to show compassion. You're going to show tenderhearted mercy. People are going to be cruel. You're going to show kindness. People are going to be arrogant. You're going to show humility. Yeah. Um, and again, Jesus is our, that's our target, right? That's what we're looking for. Look at Matthew 11, 28 through 29. Come to me, all who are weary and carry, carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I'm what? I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you'll find what? Rest for your souls. And I don't know about you. That's what I'm looking for. I'm tired of beating myself up. I'm tired of... I'm tired of feeling like I'm going through life just trying not to screw up. I want, man, I want peace. I want to find rest. And you know what? That's true for everybody else in your life as well. And that's the, that's the interesting thing about this is the more righteous that you grow, the more everyone around you is going to experience righteousness. See, at the end of the day, an attitude of humility and a lifestyle of gentleness, it helps us lead to righteousness. And that's God's goal for us.
God's goal is holiness. God's, God's goal for us is righteousness. Not just not screwing up. God's goal for us is not just to not be screw-ups. <laughs> God's goal for us is to be holy and righteous like him. Look at James again, James 3. Look at verse 18. Those who, are, those who do this, those who, who operate in this righteousness, those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and they'll reap a harvest of what? Of righteousness. So it's not only something you're going to experience, it's something that others are going to experience too. So let's wrap this up. Let's go back to the very beginning of today just for a minute. Our goal with this lesson in this series is just simply to do this. It's to reset some of you primarily relate to God as a harsh dad, again, who is sternly watching your every move, waiting for you to screw up. And our point is simply this, God is loving and he loves you and he's most interested in helping you move forward in growth. He's most interested in helping you to become righteous. So Take that small percentage of your life and do those checks. I mean, use that checklist. Go through and look at, you know, look for, hey, you know, am I being prideful in this moment? Like, is this, am I right. is coming out of selfish ambition or am I jealous or like, what's going on? I feel this thing. Because you know, you know when you feel it, right? I feel it too. And we need to check ourselves. But our encouragement is spend the greater portion of your day simply looking for those opportunities to be like Christ, to live in gentleness, be a peacemaker, live in righteousness. If you do that, it'll take care of the other part, and frankly, you'll find that peace and joy and rest we're all looking for. Yeah. So. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us, and thanks for the opportunity today to come and I mean, look at a red flag, but also see the, the antidote to that and to see that that dangerous thing is just not necessary. Father, help us realize there's an easier way, there's a better way to live. Doesn't mean we won't have rough times, but it's still better. Father, thank you for helping us with this, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna share in the Lord's Supper today, and you don't have to be a member at Adventure, you don't have to take any class here. Um, communion cups are uh, in the basket there at your table. There's a, a thin layer on top. You peel back, it'll give you access to that bread that Jesus said represents his body, which was broken for us because of our sin. And then there's a thicker tab you can peel back that'll give you access to the juice that Jesus said, this juice represents my blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of that sin that broke my body. And so share in this time and thank him for that, but ask him about your next steps in growing. All right. How can you grow to be more like Jesus and less like the world? All right. We'll come back. We'll close out together in a few minutes. Okay, I have no idea why that's up there. All right. <laughs> Literally have no idea. I, he just goes, they've got to put up this thing. Okay, there it is. Great. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so three things for you as we wrap things up. Scott County uh, College. Woof. Okay, 
College Thanksgiving uh, dinner. Adventure is a major sponsor of it, and there's a lot to sponsor on it. The sign-up sheet's back there. If you can help make some stuff for that, we really appreciate it. Um, so there's a good variety of things. Otherwise, they're just going to eat all mashed potatoes. Um, blood drive coming up in November. You can get signed up for that. And then also, something really easy to do, unless you're like me, um, we have a lot of blankets to tie up for Christmas. And they're the uh, fleece blankets we take make for kids so they go from home to home with the kids in the, in the uh, foster care system so they have something that's always theirs. We have a bunch of those if you want to take some home and sit around and tie them up while you're watching whatever you watch. All right. Um, so you can grab those and take those home today too. All right. Hey, it's been good to be here with you. If you would, bust your tables, clean up after yourselves. All right. Have a great week.